Almost time, guys. Hang on just a sec. Okay. Gotta do a sound check. Everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Yep. All right. Good. Okay. Just a few things off the top here. Um, just thinking about lab um, going into next time, just so you guys kind of have an idea of um, what we're looking at. Um, if you think about it, we have really very little to do with the gravimetric lab. You guys did um, one heating of your um, precipitate, should be back in your um, desiccators now. So you're gonna do a weighing as soon as you get in next Tuesday. Then your um, precipitates and your crucibles go back in the oven for another hour. Then they come back out, they cool off, you weigh them again and you're done. Okay, so really when you think about it, it's a whole lot of hurry up and wait. So there's not a whole lot to do next week. So what I think I'm gonna do to relieve a little bit of the pressure downstream on us is I think what I'm gonna do is have a start the next lab um, during our downtime. So I'm gonna go ahead and get that lab out to you guys. There's a couple addenda I have to make to it. And um, certainly by the end of the week, I will post that up on D2L for you guys. So you can um, start thinking about getting it into your notebook. It's actually going to be a lab we've never done before, so you guys are the first group out doing it, which I think is kind of cool. Um, it's actually going to be an um, analysis of organic acids in kombucha, so you get to actually start doing some real food chemistry here. And this is exactly the way we actually do it in the lab um, when we actually um, look at kombucha um, for real. So you're going to have some real um, kombucha samples that you're going to look at, and we'll probably end up having four or five of those. And um, we're going to sort of split it up by um, bench, and you're going to determine what the um, acid concentrations in those various kombucha samples are. So the first part of that is actually a standardization titration that we have to do. The titrant is going to be sodium hydroxide, which um, you can't just make up. And we talk about that in the um, lab handout itself. So you actually have to standardize it like we talked about in class last time. So the first part of the lab is the standardization of the um, sodium hydroxide titration or the titrant. So that's what we're gonna do. So I'll get all that up for you guys. Um, it's basically just four titrations, um, making up a solution. So it won't take us long to do, but it's going to start getting some stuff out of the way so that then when we actually do the kombucha analysis, we can break that up into two weeks after that and not have to feel rushed at all. Because one of those is going to be a potentiometric titration involving a pH electrode and a pH meter. And that's going to take a little time to do. So it would be nice to kind of break that up a little bit. All right. So I'll get that posted for you guys and plan on um, writing up. Um, far enough into that um, to do the standardization part. And I'll post all that up on D2L for you guys a little later and also remind you on Monday about it. Okay, any more questions about lab related stuff? This is just real quick related to what you just said. Um, so bases, especially strong bases, don't they, they can eat away at Pyrex glass. So wouldn't, can, that, yeah. Yeah, wouldn't that hurt our burette? Wouldn't we want to titrate the, the acid or analyte into our base or no? Actually, that's a really good, um, good point. Well, first of all, when you actually, I've already made up the sodium hydroxide solution. And when you see it, it's actually going to be in um, Nalgene bottles. So it'll be stored in plastic for exactly that purpose. Now, as far as um, being able to put it in a burette, that's not a problem because it's not gonna be in there long enough to worry about any specific kind of etching. The etching takes place over a long period of time and it's also a function of how concentrated the base is. You're only looking at a base around 10th molar. So um, okay. it's pretty, pretty <laughs> dilute. So we don't need to worry about that. But even so, I would not store it in glass. It gets stored in algae for exactly that reason. Good point. Yes, it does etch glass. <laughs> All right, any other questions? Just to clarify, on Tuesday, the only thing that's to do is the homework, right? Um, yes. Yep. And that's due. There's not going to be a lab due on Tuesday because you guys haven't actually finished it yet. So, yep, just the homework. And, of course, we'll have a quiz, too. So should we just um, guess ahead the amount of pages that we'll need for 
this current lab and then start writing a procedure after that for the next lab? Yeah, that's probably the best thing to do. So yeah, give an idea of, okay, you're gonna have some calculations and you're gonna have a results table in there and then you're gonna have some um, conclusions and discussion to have in there. So figure about how many pages you're gonna need for that. Okay. Yep, so you're down to calculations and um, tables and um, conclusions at this point. So probably no more than two to three pages. It's always better to give yourself more than you think you're gonna need though. All right, all good points, guys. All right, so picking up where we left off last time um, in class is we talked about um, standardization titrations. So I think I had a problem that I gave you guys, and I have a handout of problems that I gave you, so hopefully you have those nearby, where we um, did a standardization of a permanganate titrant. And the idea was that once we had the concentration of that titrant, we could then turn around and use it in an actual analysis titration. So part two of that is actually using the standardized titrant for analysis, okay? So during the standardization, here's what we found out. I'm not gonna reproduce the whole thing here because you guys have it, but we found out that the concentration of the permanganate, MnO4, one minus, was 0 0.01476 molar. Okay, I think that's the number we got based on the standardization. So we're gonna need that later on. So that's the reason why I wanna put it here, just to remind us about it. So now what we wanna do is some sort of an analysis utilizing that titrant, okay? So that's the next problem up in the, um, handout I gave you. And what we want to do is we're looking at nitrite here as the analog. All right. So nitrite, for example, is sometimes found in things like a fish tank. It's actually a product of fish poop. So if you want to, for example, study the um, health of your fish tank, if you will, to know whether you need to change the water or purify it or something like that so the fish isn't swimming around in its own excrement. Um, you can do an analysis of the nitrite in there, okay? So here's a reaction. It's a redox reaction. I don't think we've seen it before, but basically I have 5NO2, one minus, we'll just put our AQs to remind ourselves this is an aqueous solution. I'm giving it to you balanced. Two MnO4s, that's our permanganate. Okay. And that's going to happen in hydrogen ion. So that's acidic conditions, right? So you have to specify that. And you end up with five nitrates. Two manganese. Two pluses. And you make three waters. See if I can squeeze it in here. And water is a liquid. Okay. So there's a balanced um, redox reaction that we can utilize. All right. So remember here, the nitrite is our analyte. That's what we're trying to find. And the permanganate is going to be our titrate. And we now know it's um, molarity, right? It's going to be 0 0.01476 molar because we standardized it. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take a 20 milliliter aliquot of the analyte solution that contains the nitrite, OK? Now, when we titrate it, we're going to titrate it with the permanganate. We're going to titrate it to an endpoint. And that endpoint is going to require 10.61 milliliters of the permanganate. Okay. So now the question is for the analyte solution, I want to know the molarity of the NO2. So I want the concentration of it. Big M for molarity. So that's moles per liter of solution. All right, so you can probably sort of see how we're going to go about doing this. We always start a titration calculation like this from the standpoint of the thing that we know. Now, when I say the thing that we know, what I really am saying here is the thing that we can get the moles from, okay? 
So go back to your titrant. We know the molarity and we know the volume of the titrant that it took to get to the end point. So if I have volume and molarity, can I get moles for the titrant? Yes. Yeah, volume times molarity gives you moles, right? And then if I've actually got the um, moles of the permanganate, can I then get back to the moles of the NO21 minus the nitrite? Yes. Yeah, use a mole bridge, right? So I just take the moles of the thing that I know and relate it back to the moles of the thing I'm looking for through the balanced chemical reaction equation. Good old bonding level problem. So once I got the moles of the nitrite, right, I can then turn it back into a concentration by just dividing by the volume of the nitrite solution that I started with, which is the 20 mils, of course, converted to liters. Okay, so that's more or less how we're gonna work through this. All right, so let's go ahead and do this. I'm gonna show you sort of a little shortcut that um, the Harris text uses that I like to use in cases like this, because it just cuts down on some of the conversions you've got to do. So if we're starting out with a volume in milliliters, that can be 10.61 mils, and that's gonna be of the MnO4. Okay, I'm gonna multiply by the molarity. Now watch what I do here. You guys know that molarity is expressed in terms of moles per liter of solution, right? Now, is there any reason why I couldn't express it as millimoles of solute per milliliter of solution? Because see what happens. The millis actually cancel out both top and bottom. So I can express molarity in terms of either moles per liter or millimoles per milliliter. It's going to be the same thing. Everybody see that? See how the millis kind of cancel out? So if I got milliliters, let's just express the molarity in terms of millimoles per milliliter. Just makes life a lot easier, right? So I know what the concentration is. It's going to be 0.01476. That doesn't change. And now I'm going to express it as millimoles of the permanganate per milliliter of a permanganate solution. That's an MnO4 one minus, okay? Now notice that's nice because now the milliliters cancel with the milliliters. And I don't have to worry about that step of converting milliliters over the liters, okay? So that's gonna work out just fine for me. Now, if I can work in terms of mole to mole relationships, can I work in terms of millimole to millimole relationships? Sure, it's the same thing, right? So for every two millimoles of MnO4, the balanced equation tells me that I'm gonna utilize five millimoles of NO2. Okay, everybody see that? I shut my phone off here. Uh, it's my aunt, she's gonna to have to wait. Okay, that was nice of her to call though. So let's see, millimoles of MnO4 will cancel with millimoles of MnO4. And I'm gonna be left with millimoles of NO2 minus. Everybody see that? Yep. yep. Okay, so now what's the last thing I gotta do to convert this back into a molarity? What do I have to divide by? Milliliters to cancel out the milli. Yeah, you got it. So I got 20.00 milliliters. And that's of the original aliquot of the unknown nitrite. And that's millimole, or sorry, that's milliliters of NO2 minus. Okay. So now what have I got? I got millimoles of NO2 per milliliters of NO2. So that's the same thing as molarity, isn't it? Okay, so when I work this out. I'm going to end up getting 3.915 times 10 to the minus fourth. And that just becomes molarity of NO2 minus. And that should be good to four sig figs, right? Yeah. So I got four sig figs in my both my volumes and also in my concentration of the permanganate. So 
that shows you sort of a nice round, sort of a nice direct way of how we're going to get back to the um, acid concentration in the kombucha. Okay, so we're going to first start by standardizing the NaOH titrant so we can determine its exact concentration to a certain number of sig figs. And then we're going to use that once we have it to um, then get back to the concentration or amount of acid in the kombucha. Okay. So the calculations are exactly the same. All right, any questions about what we did there before we leave it? Everybody good? Okay. All right, so now we get to change gears a little bit, guys. So the next thing that we gotta talk about is acid-base theory, because we're at that point now where we know how to deal with titrations. We know how to utilize a burette. We know how to standardize. We know how to analyze, okay? So now it's talking about the specific kind of reaction that we're gonna be focusing on in this lab. So that's gonna be acid-base reaction. So we wanna come back and review a little bit of acid-base theory. All right. Now, let's go back to what we know about bonding. Go back to your bonding definition. What's the definition of an acid? Does anybody remember kind of what the general definition of an acid from bonding was? Uh, a protonated water. Okay, that's a good definition. But basically, when I teach bonding, I kind of use that sort of what I call high school definition of acids and bases, which is what we call Arrhenius theory. I think it's HN. And what Arrhenius theory says is this. It says that an acid is a good source of hydrogen ion in solution. Now we know that because we can look at something that we know is an acid like HCl, for example. So if I put HCl aqueous there, we know that HCl is a strong acid, or you might remember that from bonding. And by the way, what does a strong acid do? What's a, how is a strong acid different from a weak acid? Fully dissociates. It fully dissociates. So if this comes apart like a salt, right? I would get H1 plus in solution, and I would get Cl1 minus also in solution, okay? So we can see there that according to the Arrhenius definition, an acid will dissociate to give us H1 plus in solution. How about a base? What does a base do? Okay, is so a good source of, isn't it a good source of uh, uh, blah, 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 uh, hydroxide ion? Yeah, that's it, the other one, right? So a base is gonna be a good source of hydroxide in solution. All right, and for example, we know a good dissociating base is something like sodium hydroxide. It's soluble in water. Okay, so it comes apart 100% because it's a strong base. Give me sodium ion and hydroxide ion. Okay, so if we go back to like our bonding definitions of these things, we ultimately know that if we look at a net ionic reaction between an acid and a base, according to the Arrhenius definition, what's the net ionic reaction always for an acid reacting with a base or a neutralization reaction? What do we always write it as? Uh, hydrogen and hydrogen ion and a hydroxide ion forming water. You got it. H plus plus OH minus go into H2O liquid, okay? So remember when we talked about those molecular ionic and net ionic um, reactions of acids and bases in bonding, we always said the net ionic reaction was hydrogen ion combining with hydroxide ion to give us water, okay? 
So all that's based on what we call the simple Arrhenius theory or definition, okay? That's our bonding level understanding of acid-base theory. Of course, I think we also throw in that idea of a strong acid and a strong base versus a weak acid or a, weak ba or a strong base. And we know that strong dissociates 100%, weak dissociates less than 100%. So you get partial dissociation of the acid or the base in the case of a weak one, okay? So that's about as far as we take it back in bonding. So now we're a little more sophisticated, right? So now, since we're in the quant lab and you guys are in dynamics, we find actually that the Arrhenius definition is somewhat limited, okay? So it doesn't really apply to all acids and bases out there. It applies to acids that obviously dissociate to give us a hydrogen ion, and it obviously will apply to bases that dissociate like NaOH to give us hydroxide ion. But there are lots of other situations that we can characterize as acid-base reactions that don't really follow that definition. So we need a more general definition. So the more general definition we're going to talk about is this one. It's called the bronsted lowry definition. And the way this one... Um, differs is now we talk about an acid and a base reaction as basically shuttling a proton back and forth. It's like somebody's going to pitch the proton, somebody's going to catch the proton. It's like throwing a football or a baseball, right? Somebody starts with it, somebody ends with it. So that's how we're going to look at the Bronsted-Lowry definition. So in this case, a Bronsted-Lowry acid is going to be a hydrogen ion donor. So it's anything that donates a proton or a hydrogen ion to something else. Okay, so it's the pitcher. The base is gonna be the catcher. So if the acid is the proton donor, the base is gonna be the proton acceptor. Everybody okay with me calling an H1 plus a proton? Does everybody see why that's a proton? Right, because what's a hydrogen atom? It's just a proton and an electron. If you strip the electron out to make the ion, what are you left with? Just a proton. Okay, so a lot of times, rather than saying H1 plus, I'll just refer to that as a proton. Everybody okay with that idea? Yep. Yeah. All right, good. So this is gonna be the definition we're gonna use most of the time. I'll throw you out a third definition. It's the most general. So actually, let's just put more general here. So we know that that's why it's important. And then the last one is the Lewis definition. And we'll talk about that one later on as well. That's the most general definition we could have. Okay. And a Lewis acid is defined as an electron pair acceptor. So we're talking about bonding here. Okay, so when we talk about electron pairs being donated or accepted, we're talking about forming bonds here. So a base is gonna be an electron pair acceptor. Oh, sorry, donor. Gotta get that right. The acid's the acceptor, the base is the donor. Okay, a good example of a Lewis acid base reaction that you guys have already seen this semester is in your dynamics class, you talked about forming, for example, complex ions, right? And you're getting a reaction occurring between a metal ion and a ligand, right? Is that always what happens? Yep. In the case of um, that kind of bond being formed, which one has the electron pair, the metal or the ligand? Uh, the ligand has the electron pair and it donates yeah. it. And right, the iron is electron deficient or whatever the metal is. You could say iron, magnesium, what, or manganese, whatever we want to say. It's going to be electron deficient, right? So the idea here is that we want to form a covalent bond where the ligand brings in the electron pair and the metal ion accepts it. So in the most general scheme of things, 
that's an acid-base reaction, okay, in the Lewis sense, because the metal ion is the acid and the ligand is the base, okay? And we'll come back and talk about complexation reactions and titrations, and we'll bring this whole idea of the Lewis definition back up then. But you've already seen this, okay? But for us, one we're going to use in class 99% of the time is going to be the Bronsted Lowry definition. For us, it's the most useful one. Okay. So let's think about how we would kind of rewrite the dissociation of HCl by the Bronsted Lowry definition. Okay. So in this case, I've got my HCl aqueous, and we know that it's going to dissociate, right? But now that proton's got to go somewhere. I can't just leave it in solution as a proton. So here's how we get around the situation. The other thing that HCl is in solution with is going to be the solvent, which is water. Okay. So what ends up happening in this case, it is still a strong acid. So this still goes 100% to the right. So we're going to still leave it there with a single arrow which in our world really means that it just has a really huge equilibrium constant associated with it, is if the HCl is the acid and the water is the base, okay? Where's that proton from the acid gonna go? Wouldn't it go on to the water to make uh, uh, ozone? Not ozone, you're close, hydronium. Yep, you're gonna make hydronium ion. So that's H3O plus. And then we're left with chloride ion, right? So I can just take a simple dissociation of a strong acid like this, and by involving water, I can now treat it as a Bronsted Lowry acid base reaction, okay? So now it's just, we're taking it a step further, if you will. Now here's where you really can see it, okay? So let's take, for example, a weak base we're familiar with, like ammonia. Ammonia is NH3 aqueous. It's a base, it's a weak base. So when it, as we say, dissociates, according to Bronsted-Lowry, now if you look at this, NH3, can I treat this as, a, as an Arrhenius space? Because what does an Arrhenius space do? What's something that dissociates by virtue of its, of its formula to give us hydroxide ion? You see anything in NH3 that would give us hydroxide ion? No, I don't see any oxygens in there, right? So this is where, in a sense, that least general Arrhenius def definition kind of falls apart. But now, if I let this happen in water and I utilize water again, like I did before, but now let's let water be the acid. All right, I'm gonna use a double arrow here because this is a weak base, so it doesn't dissociate 100%. So we've got an equilibrium to consider here. All right, the acid does what according to the Bronsted-Lowry definition? Donate or accept the proton? Donate. Donate. So where do you think it's gonna donate it to? Uh, Always in base. Oh yeah. So could we do that? Well, let's take a look at this. If you actually broke down the Lewis structure of NH3, I didn't write it there, but there's an electron pair on that nitrogen there. You got a lone pair on that nitrogen. Oh, well, if I use the water to donate a proton, that proton is electron deficient. So now I could form a bond between that proton and the nitrogen through that electron pair on the nitrogen. So what am I going to make? I'm going to make NH4 one plus. That's the ammonium ion. Oh yeah, that's one of those polyatomics you have to memorize, right? And then what am I left with? Hydroxide. Hydroxide. Oh, so we do get hydroxide after all. But the hydroxide comes from the deprotonation of the water. So in the event that we're not using water as our solvent, but something with, let's say, similar properties, so uh, a, different, um, a different electronegative atom would, would, let's say, a hydra like a H and an F still be considered a 
an acid so would that make would that if you understand what i'm trying to say would that dissociate in the same way and have similar properties or no yes it does the um, okay. classic example of that now we don't really talk about it in here because everything we do is aqueous and you really don't even talk about it in dynamics but the classic example of that is a situation where you're using ammonia as the solvent okay, okay. So now you could have a situation where you could have, say, HCl dissociating in ammonia, and it works the same way, okay? So the HCl would still be the acid, and ammonia would be the base. So you end up getting ammonium, and then you end up getting chloride ion. But that's the classic non-aqueous example. But everything that applies here to water applies to um, any other like solvent. Does that answer your question, more or less? Yep. So it works the same way. You know, you can use the same um, theory to apply to different other solvents besides water. Yep. So there's another situation, and this is a better situation because it sort of shows you why we have to apply this little bit more sophisticated definition here, okay? Now, <clears throat> how about another one since we're here? Let's talk about acetic acid. That's a weak acid. HC2H3O2, that's acetic acid. It's aqueous, it's a weak acid. So when we talk about it dissociating, it can dissociate in water, right? So that's normally how we would do it. So the H2O is there as a liquid. Okay, so what is the water, acid or base? Base. Base, so we already defined the acetic acid as the acid, so the water has to be the base, okay? I'm going to again use a double arrow here because this is going to be dissociation of weak acids, so it doesn't all go to the right. We end up with a distribution of reactants and products. So what are we going to get? The acid's going to pitch the proton to the base. So what's one of our products? Uh, acetate. Acetate, okay. What's the other one? Hydronium. Hydronium, good. All right, now, if we take a look at these two things, there's a few ways we can go with this. Because again, the ammonia is a weak base. The um, acetic acid is a weak acid. So now we have these so-called dissociation equations of a weak acid in water and a weak base in water. Now, as we said, we have to actually um, specify these things in terms of equilibrium constants, right? So these would be equilibrium constants we can go look up. So looking at the bottom one first, this is governed by an equilibrium constant called a Ka. The A there stands for acid because it's an acid dissociation. It's a weak acid dissociating in water. Okay, so how about the top one that involves ammonia? That's a weak base dissociating in water. So what do you think you would call that one? A K what? B. KB for base, very good, okay? So now if you wanted to, you could write equilibrium expressions based on the law of mass action for these things. So do it for the Ka reaction. Okay, so this just sort of lets us brush up on our equilibrium technique here. If I wanted to um, actually express this in terms of the law of mass action, what is that? Oh yeah, it's the concentrations at equilibrium of reactants over products raised to their respective stoichiometric powers. Now, of course, this is all one to one to one to one throughout, so that makes it kind of easy. So it's the concentration of the C2H3O2 times the concentration of the hydronium. Okay, what goes in the denominator, guys? Reactants. Okay. So we have H C2 H3 O2. Is that right? No. Yeah. No. <laughs> ah, what's wrong? H2O is a pure liquid, so it doesn't go. Yeah, it's a pure liquid and a solvent. So we got to remember to take it out of there, right? Can't put that in there. 
I wanted to put that in there to remind everybody about that, but that can't show up in there. Everybody remember that little rule? All right, and that has a K value and it turns out to be like 1.75 times 10 to the minus fifth or something like that. So what does that tell us about the um, equilibrium, the position of the equilibrium? Does it favor reactant or product at equilibrium? Reactant. Reactant, very much reactant. So what does that tell us about the strength of acetic acid? Very weak. It's very weak, yeah. You're not getting very many dissociations at all. That's exactly right. So you're not making a whole lot of hydronium ion. So this is not gonna be a very acidic solution. So it turns out the acidity of the solution is going to depend upon two things. Obviously, it'll depend upon the initial concentration of the acid you've got in there. But the other thing it's going to depend upon is the Ka value or the um, extent to which the dissociation will occur. OK? And you could do the same thing for the Kb for the ammonia if you wanted to. Let's go ahead and write that out just to show that you can do it. <clears throat> so that's going to be products over reactants. So that's going to be NH4 one plus times the hydroxide ion concentration. Again, all at equilibrium. And water doesn't go in there. So we just put the NH3 concentration at the bottom here. No water in there. And I could go look that one up as well. And it's around the same value. It turns out to be, I want to say, around 1.7 times 10 to the minus fifth or somewhere in there as well. OK. So again, what does that tell you? What well, tells you that ammonia is not a very strong base? In other words, most of what we have in solution at equilibrium is going to be the undissociated ammonia, the NH3. We don't make a lot of the NH4, one plus, or the hydroxide, okay? So both of these very, very much um, lean toward the side of the reactant at equilibrium. All right, so everybody okay with that? Everybody kind of understand what a Ka and a Kb is? Ka is always the weak acid dissociating in water. The Kb always corresponds to the weak base dissociating in water, all right? Now, there's another thing we can do here. So let me go ahead and rewrite the acid reaction back. So again, I'm just kind of throwing out all the different definitions and things we can do here. Double arrow, I'm gonna make hydronium. and acetate. All right, so here's the deal. I can tell you what the acid is and what the base is, right? And we know this is defined as a Ka here, so it's an acid dissociation constant. So I know that the um, acetic acid is the acid in solution. Water is gonna be the base in solution. And then what I can do is recognize that since this reaction goes in both directions, right? If I have an acid and a base on one side of the arrow, I'm gonna have an acid and a base on the other side because it's just a reversible acid-base reaction because of the double arrow, right? So now what we end up defining here are what we call conjugate acids and bases. So if you look at it moving in the other direction from right to left, who's the acid over on the right-hand side now? If I'm going from right back to left, who's the acid now? Hydronium. Yeah. So I'm going to call that the conjugate acid. So then the um, acetate ion has to be the base because it's accepting the proton from the conjugate acid. So it's now going to become the conjugate base. OK. Does that make sense to everybody? So now I can generate these conjugate acid base pairs. Now, I could do the same thing for the base reaction. Let's just do it since we're here.
three. So that's going to be defined by a KB or a base dissociation constant. What do we say we got? We got NH4 one plus and hydroxide, right? All right, so if we said that the ammonia was the original base and the water was the original acid, okay, look to the other side and think about that as an acid-base reaction going in reverse. Who's the conjugate acid now? The ammonium. The ammonium, yeah. So I'll just put CA there for conjugate acid because it's pitching the proton. Where's the proton going? To the hydroxide. Yeah, so that's going to become my conjugate. Base. So you can see anytime I have an equilibrium situation here, I can define these conjugate acid base pairs. That's what we call these things, conjugate acid base pairs. Okay, so that's another important thing to be able to do. All right. Everybody with me so far? Anything I need to kind of go back over? We're just sort of building on what we already know and bringing a little equilibrium back into this. Everybody good? Yep. All right. Awesome. Again, if anything needs to be clarified, just ask. Okay. Next thing. We want to start talking about the pH scale. Yeah, and this is something I think all of you guys are familiar with, right? So when I tell you about the pH scale, how would you define that? I mean, what's it telling us? So if I have a solution and I determine its pH, what's that telling me about that solution? It's a, it's a logarithm of the concentration of hydronium in the solution. Right. What's that telling me about the solution? Um, how much, the lower you are, the more hydronium you have exponentially. Yeah. So basically how acidic the solution is or how basic the solution is. That's what the pH scale is telling me. Okay. So the scale itself is a measure of acidicity of a solution. All right, now we talked a little bit about that pH scale and we can think of it as sort of a number line, if you will. Okay, and remember it has a neutral point in it. What's the neutral point when a solution is neither acidic or basic? And you remember that from bonding probably. Seven. Seven, okay, so seven is sort of the midpoint on the scale. That's my neutral point. So what that's telling me is that whatever concentration of hydronium I've got in there, it's actually being negated or canceled out by an equal concentration of hydroxide. Okay, so that's what neutrality means, right? Now, if I'm below seven on the scale, so if I go down to say, let's just say zero here and all the way up to let's say 14 up here, okay? Zero to seven, am I acidic or basic? Acidic. Yeah, so anything below seven is acidic. Anything above seven on the pH scale is going to be basic. Okay. Everybody kind of sort of remember, got that down? So here's the interesting thing where does the pH scale come from? All right, this is kind of sort of quantitatively what it means. And ultimately, I think um, somebody, I think Andrew or somebody told me what the definition was. One of you guys did. All right, and we'll get back to that. But where does all that come from? Well, it's interesting. It actually comes from the dissociation of water. So we're talking about a pure water solution here, guys. All right, so what we can do is write what is called an autoionization reaction. Okay, so that basically means water reacting with water. Now, the interesting thing about water is that because of its structure, if I draw a Lewis structure of water, right, it looks kind of like this, right? Now, the interesting thing about water is that 
it can act as a Bronsted-Lowry acid or it can act as a Bronsted-Lowry base. And we saw that before, right? Like in the case of acetic acid, it acted like a base, but when we let it react with ammonia, it acts like an acid. Why is it? Well, because water has a hydrogen ion that can be donated here by breaking that bond between the oxygen and the hydrogen. But I also have electron pairs here that could be donated for an acid, of course, to come in and grab, okay? So that's why water can be either an acid or a base. It's got the proton that it can donate, but it's also got the electron pair that it can donate, okay? So it can either be a Bronsted-Lowry um, acid or a Bronsted-Lowry base. All right, so as a result of this, let's just let one of those waters be the acid. It doesn't matter which one is which, let the other one be the base. So what two products am I gonna make, guys? What's one product I'll get? Hydronium ion. Yeah, we're gonna get hydronium. Yeah, always good to just follow the proton, right? What's the other ion I get? Uh, hydroxide. Hydroxide. Very good. Okay. So that's the auto ionization reaction of water. I got a, an interesting little story about that. And by the way, it's got an equilibrium constant of its own. And it's a very important one. It's called KW, okay? It's called KW. And it's a really tiny value. It's one times 10 to the minus 14th. But here's my funny story about this. You know, when you go to get your PhD, you have to go through sometime either the second or the third year normally of the PhD after you've completed all your coursework and you've kind of started into your independent research project. You actually have to defend your project to your committee. And it's also a qualification exam. So basically you spend about an hour talking to your committee behind closed doors to defend your project. So you go through a presentation and then they drill you on it and ask you a bunch of questions about it. And then what happens is you might take a break and then reconvene or not, okay? And then it's what you got Open season is what you call it. So basically you go up in front of a whiteboard or chalkboard and you got your five committee members in there and they can basically for the next, however long they wanna keep you in there, it could be anywhere from an hour to three hours. They can ask you anything they wanna ask you about anything involving any aspect of chemistry. So this is really scary. I mean, you know, they can ask you anything, <laughs> you know? And they're not gonna hold back. It's not just gonna be stuff about your project. They can go back and usually what they do is they try to, cause they know you're scared, right? So they usually will start by asking you something really simple like what's your name? Just to kind of break the ice a little. And if you can answer that, then they can start asking you chemistry questions. All right, so when I got in there, you know, they didn't bother with what's your name but they figured they'd throw a general chemistry softball at me to get me started. So the question I got was, write down the autoionization reaction for water. That was the first question I got in my um, qualification exam. It was this, that reaction I just showed you. That was the reaction I actually had to write on the board for them. So then my boss got a little cocky when I got it right. So he says, okay, smart ass. Now write the autoionization reaction for acetonitrile. Acetonitrile is this. Yeah, you guys go figure it out. You can probably do it. But anyway, that was the second question I got. Well, I got that one right too. So then they commenced to the hard stuff, all right? But anyway, it was kind of interesting. But let me just finish by doing this. What I wanna do, if I know a KW, and I told you that was 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14th, and that's one of those numbers you kind of keep in your head because you use it all the time. I can make an ice table, couldn't I? Now, water doesn't show up, in the law of mass action, so we know we exit out. What's the initial concentration? Well, zero and zero, because nothing's happened. The reaction's gotta go to the right, so I get an X and an X, and then I add down to my E line, I get an X and an X. Okay, so now if I plug everything back into the law of mass action, my KW is equal to what? It's the hydronium ion concentration times the hydroxide ion concentration. 
right? Nothing in the denominator because water is the only thing on the left-hand side. It doesn't show up. And all that's equal to 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14th. That was that equilibrium constant I just gave you. So now I just plug everything back in. I get x times x, which is x squared, which is 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14th. So now take the square root of both sides. You get 1.0 times 10 to the minus seventh. That's one you can do in your head. That's a molarity. Now that's equal to what? The hydronium ion concentration at equilibrium, but it's also equal to hydroxide ion concentration at equilibrium. Ah, so what point on the pH scale are we at if those two concentrations are equal to each other? Seven. Seven, we're at seven. Okay, so that brings us back to the definition. What does pH seven mean? Well, here's the definition. This is what I'll leave you with. The definition of pH is that it's equal to the negative base 10 log of the hydronium ion concentration of any aqueous solution at equilibrium. So in this particular case, it's negative log of what? 1.0 times 10 to the minus. Now, if you crank that out on your calculator, guess what you get? Seven. Seven. Seven, exactly. Spot on. I could put a bunch of zeros after it if I wanted to. OK, so does that put us where we should be on the pH scale? If um, the hydronium ion and the hydroxide ion are in equal concentrations and I got a totally neutral solution? Yeah, that's exactly where I ought to be. So that's a little proof we do to show where the neutral point on the pH scale comes from, okay? So I can do it from this cute little ice table and then utilize this definition of pH here to get me back to that number. So that's gonna be an important definition for us to remember because it's gonna work for um, any aqueous solution. So if I wanna know the pH of any aqueous solution, all I gotta do is figure out what the equilibrium concentration of the hydronium ion in that solution is, and then I'm good to go. All right, so that's what we're gonna pick up with next time, guys. Any questions? Well, quick question, we're getting backwards. So if we just say we have a pH of zero, so if we just take times 10 to the zero, is that gonna give us a molarity of one? So our molar highest possible concentration of hydronium is one, mol one mole, I mean, one mol molarity? Yes and no. You did the calculation <laughs> correctly, okay? But let's go back and do something interesting while I got you. You guys know, that the concentration of HCl concentrated, right, is equal to what? 12.1. 12.1 1. 1 mole, right? <laughs> now, you also know that this thing dissociates 100%, right? So that means the hydronium ion concentration is going to be what? If it dissociates 100% in solution, what's my hydronium ion concentration? Would it also be 12.1? It's also 12.1. Now stick that into your pH definition and tell me what you get. I can't do it because I don't have a calculator here, but what do you guys get? Negative 1.0795. 795? Yeah, okay. So that's interesting. I get a negative pH. Now that's interesting because usually we think of the pH scale as just going from zero to seven to 14. But I just showed you that in the real world, you can have a negative pH. That's perfectly okay. Kind of interesting, right? So, it, so it's just centered around seven pretty much because that's the auto ionization constant. And that's you what it gives it. us. So okay. that's the neutrality point based upon the auto ionization of water. Yep, you got it. All right, any other questions, guys? Okay, I'll get that lab posted to you guys on uh, by Friday, hopefully, and um, I'll see you on Monday. So have a great weekend, everybody. You Thank too. you. All right, have a good one.